he gave me a book on art forgery. I found myself drawn to these old masters. How did these artists take paint from a palette, arrange it on a canvas? I began to unlock the secrets. I was a storehouse of knowledge of how to create an illusion, present it to a experienced expert, manipulate his mind, and convince him and bring him to the inevitable conclusion that the painting is genuine. We flooded the market with my paintings, and I couldn't believe what I did. I couldn't believe it. Then the dominoes started falling, and eventually the FBI were led to my door. They uncovered a mountain of evidence against me. But they never actually got you. At this point, you've sold a lot. You've got like a million dollars in cash. You sold <laughs> one painting for 717000 Why did it go away? Why did you never get indicted? And how are we having this conversation? <laughs> I guess that's the greatest story of all. To hear how Ken Perenni made millions in art forgery, dodged the mafia and the FBI, subscribe to The Jordan Harbinger Show and check out episode 282 in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening now. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, Prosecutor Glenn Kirshner joins us to discuss the Robert Wan case. Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my starstruck co-host, Alice. Hello, Alice. Brett, Brett, I am starstruck. I am starstruck because, you know, it's one thing when we have really great guests on the show. It's another thing when it's a fellow prosecutor in one of the most riveting cases I think we've ever covered. So, yes, I am starstruck because we have the prosecutor from the Robert Wong case, Glenn Kirshner, here with us. Glenn, thank you so much for taking time out of your very, very busy life to talk to us about a case from many years ago in your career. Hey, my pleasure. It's great being with you both. I got to say, Glenn, it is it is a little intimidating. We play prosecutors, but you're the real deal. So just the fact that you're willing to take this time to talk about this case, I think speaks to how much you care about it and how much you care about getting justice in this case, which is still available. Before we get into Robert Wan, though, I want you to have an opportunity to briefly introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, your career, and what you've been doing since you were able to, to get a well-deserved retirement. Yeah. So in three minutes or less, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. I grew up a gutter kid in Jersey for real, had my scrapes with the law growing up. My pop was a high school football coach. My mom was a fiery little Irish woman who sold real estate. And I attended Washington and Lee University undergrad as a journalism major. I was on Army ROTC scholarship because my folks couldn't afford to put me through college. So I owed four years of active duty time, which was perfect for me because I was always drawn to military service. I was also always drawn to law enforcement, though I knew I didn't want to be a police officer. When I decided to take an educational delay of my active duty time, I put myself through law school up in Boston, New England law, took my first trial practice class. And that's when I realized that I think I might enjoy this prosecution thing. And it was nice because it brought my military service and my interest in law enforcement together. I started in the 80s as an Army JAG prosecutor in the 6th Infantry Division up in Anchorage, Alaska. Got to spend three years prosecuting court-martial cases. I then did three and a half years 
as a government appellate lawyer in the JAG Corps, arguing, briefing and arguing cases before the two levels of military appellate courts. We also did some work. There's a direct line of appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court from the highest military court. So never got to argue there, but I did get to submit some briefs in opposition to petitions for writs of cert, which is the closest I ever got to the Supreme Court. I then decided to leave the Army because at the ba about the six or seven year mark in your active duty time, they promote you out of the courtroom. And I didn't want to spend the rest of my career supervising other JAGs. So I transitioned to the Department of Justice, specifically the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia, spent nearly a quarter of a century there as a federal prosecutor. As you all know, it's the only U.S. Attorney's Office in the country or in the territories where we are both the traditional federal prosecutors, but we're also the local DAs. We're the local prosecutors for the District of Columbia. So I had the unbelievably vibrant prosecutorial experience of trying a bunch of RICO cases and then walking across the street and trying more than 50 murder cases in my time there. And I also got to be the, the chief of the homicide section. So I supervised 30 federal homicide prosecutors and oversaw all murder, grand jury investigations and prosecutions in the city. Very, very vibrant experience, a very rewarding career. After a little over 30 years as a Fed, I decided to retire. Difficult decision because I loved what I did. Then I started running my mouth on TV. I'm a legal analyst for MSNBC. I then came up with my own YouTube channel, Who Knew? And I'm now, I post a legal analysis video every day, seven days a week trying to unravel and explain for the people in layman's terms what's going on on this insane legal landscape, you know, that we're all living through, particularly with all the, the court cases that are up and running against Donald Trump and others. So I don't do it from a place of politics, even though people don't necessarily believe that. It's all about the rule of law and allegiance to the Constitution. It's not about whether you have an R or a D or an I by your name. I also teach criminal justice at George Washington University, and I volunteer with homicide families, so I'm a bit of a jack of all trades now. Glenn, I mean, first of all, thank you for your service. That's just an incredible career, and I'm so glad that when you went into retirement, you didn't just go, you know, sip coffee on a beach, that instead you created Justice Matters on YouTube, because I think that type of legal analysis is something we try to bring to our show and something that we have found people really crave. That is not just a talking head on TV that wants to get the most clicks or the loudest argument out, but to truly seek to understand things that are core to what the Constitution provides for the citizens of this country. So thank you for your service, both as a JAG, as a prosecutor, but also now in lending your voice to the legal dialogue that's out there. And so you all know <laughs> that Glenn is, is wildly, wildly experienced in homicides. But there's one homicide in particular from your career that we'd like to talk about, and that is the Robert Wong case. Can you give us, you know, take us back to where you were and how you became involved in this case? Yeah, really um, unusual case. You know, a call came in from a very high-end million-dollar-plus home in Northwest Washington, D.C. Uh, the call was placed by a gentleman named Victor Zaborski, who was one of the residents at 1509 Swan Street. And he reported that somebody had killed their friend in their, in their guest room and please send an ambulance. And that was the beginning of what would become this a almost unbelievable odyssey that I then went on as the prosecutor in the case. The murder occurred in 2006. Uh, I tried the case in 2010, and I don't think I've ever stopped living this case ever since. You know, there's so much to unpack about it. I got involved. I was chief of homicide at the time, and I didn't assume responsibility for the case right away. I did go to the scene, and I will say that my practice was I did not send my prosecutors to active crime scenes because they're volatile, they're dangerous. Only about half of the murders in Washington, D.C. end up closing with an arrest. So I would be sending people all around the city at all hours of the night, and those, and many of the cases would never ripen into prosecutions. And then prosecutors you know, think they know best under all circumstances. So they would be out there trying to direct the evidence technicians and the detectives about what should be done and who should be interviewed. And 
we really, that's not our area of expertise, even though we think everything is our area of expertise. And then even worse, if you recall something differently than one of your witnesses or detectives recalls what was going on on the scene, you've now made yourself a witness, perhaps even a Brady witness with exculpatory evidence. So the exception was when it was an indoor scene and we could control it and we could hold the house under an active search warrant for as long as we needed, sometimes weeks. So I went to the scene uh, the day after, I believe, the, the homicide. And, you know, it was really bizarre in lots of ways. And I've seen lots of murder scenes over the years. This house was pristine, not a thing out of place, very high end, expensive stuff everywhere, flat screen TVs, laptops sitting on the floor, high end knickknacks and vases and stuff that, you know, I never did really appreciate as a gutter kid growing up in Jersey, but nothing, nothing was disturbed. Nothing was out of place. Nothing was ransacked. There was no forced entry. What there was, was a young man, a young lawyer named Robert Wan, who was found dead in a bed, lying ramrod straight on top of the sheets and the comforter, which had been folded down at a perfect 45 degree angle. And the body was on top of the folded down sheets and comforter, not the way I typically go to bed. And when the first EMS worker arrived on the scene, what he found was Robert dead in the guest room bed on the second floor of a three floor townhouse. And he had three gaping chest wounds and he had no blood on his torso and there was no blood in the room and nothing was disturbed or out of order. And Robert's not one, but two wallets were lying out in the open on a, on a table that was at the foot of the bed, as was his Blackberry. This was back in 2006 and his Movado watch. And there was all sorts of expensive stuff in the room. So this was not exactly a burglary gone bad. This was a stone cold mystery. And I think most curiously, the three men who were home at the time and who were first met by the detectives when they arrived on the scene that night were Victor Zaborski, who had placed the 911 call, Joe Price and Dylan Ward. All three men were in crisp white terry cloth robes. Their, their hair seemed to still be wet as if they just stepped out of a good executive steam. And they were sitting there on the couch. The detectives had them sit on the couch and they would tell the detectives nothing about what happened in that house. In fact, when either Victor or Dylan tried to chime in and say something, Joe, who was the leader of this three-way relationship we came to find out, would shoot them death glares. In other words, he was conveying, shut up, I will take the lead here. So to say that was a curious crime scene is a pretty dramatic understatement. Let me ask you this, because you've, you've said something that I think raises an interesting question, and that's that the EMTs found Robert dead. But despite the fact that I, I agree with you that he was dead, there was some argument about whether or not he was, whether or not you know they attempted to do various life-saving measures. They took him from the scene to the hospital. What were your thoughts on those decisions, and did that have an adverse effect on the investigation as it went on? You know, in an ideal world, we would be able to save every victim before they died when it is a violent crime scene that EMS encounters. Protocol, however, is if a body, if somebody appears to be dead, and it appears that life-saving measures would be pointless, there is real evidentiary value of leaving a body on the scene and not disturbing it. Those are difficult calls for EMS workers to make because first and foremost, they want to try to save human life. What I will say is Jeff Baker, who was the first EMS worker to arrive on the scene, was pretty candid about saying Robert was dead. It was clear to me he had been dead for some time. And that was based on, among other things, putting monitors on him and finding no pulseless electrical activity. He, he was cool to the touch. But Jeff Baker said, I am going to take him to the hospital and see if they can revive him, even though protocol really dictated the body should have remained on the scene. 
So you can't begrudge an EMS worker for perhaps breaking protocol to try to save a life, which obviously there was no saving Robert. So you've given a lot of, you know, description of the actual scene when you showed up that very next day. When you got the call, who called you, first of all, and what was relayed to you? Did you have any impression of what you were walking into in terms of an initial story, any sort of initial doubts from anyone who was on the scene first before you got there? I'd I just love to hear how, you know, your perception as you picked up that call. Yeah. And, you know, I was deputy chief and chief of homicide for a combined 10 years. And I was in the homicide practice for 22 of my 30 years as a prosecutor. So I wish I had better recall of all of the calls that I took under those circumstances. I don't remember who first called me. It probably would have been the lead homicide detective, Brian Wade, who was a terrific detective, who would have given me a a short briefing about the scene Now, when I arrived, I should make clear, the body had been removed because I arrived the next day, but the scene was described to me when I arrived and nothing had been disturbed, but the body had been taken. So, you know, I I probably would have been given just sort of the, the, the gross features of the story that they had thus far. Now, they took all three of the residents of the, the house. We were believing they were witnesses at that point in time, not suspects, not people of interest. We thought their friend had been killed and we had to unravel what in the world had happened. But it became pretty clear that once these three were down at the homicide branch being interviewed, everything was wrong. Everything was wrong with the scene. I mean, when you have a scene that has no forced entry, nothing taken, nothing disturbed, ransacked, nothing missing, and you have three, you have four people in a home, one turns up dead. You, you have to start looking at the three who were on the scene with at least interest. And, you know, the stories that they were telling to the detectives, their sort of main features matched. A lot of the details didn't, but we kind of figured that out moving forward. But, you know, the main features were Robert was a friend of theirs. And in fact, he was. Robert had gone to I believe, undergraduate school with Joe Price, and they had been friendly over the years. In fact, Robert and Robert's wife, Kathy, had been over to their house multiple times. They even threw a 30th birthday party for Robert. So there was no no known motive or animosity either, you know, between or among any of the three guys and Robert. But the story they tell is that, you know, Robert was spending the night over there as a matter of work convenience because he had to meet the night crew at Radio Free Asia, where Robert had just taken a job as general counsel. And so because he didn't want to get up at three in the morning and have to drive in from northern Virginia, he basically stayed at the house of a friend, Joe Price. And the story they told was that, well, Robert came over. He came in, we stood at the kitchen island, we had a glass of water, and then we all went to bed. Even that didn't make sense because these guys love to entertain. And if they're going to have a friend staying over for the evening, it was on. There's going to be appetizers and drinks and it's going to be fun. Not, we had a glass of water and everybody went to bed. (laughs) Instantly, these details jump out as, as problematic and not terribly credible. And then they say, well, we all go to bed. Now, mind you, Joe and Victor, who were a married couple, had a bedroom on the third floor. Dylan, who was, they were in a three-way polyamorous relationship, these three men. Dylan had a bedroom on the second floor, and it was on the second floor where the guest bedroom was located, where Robert was found dead. And the story they tell is, well, at some point we hear an alarm, a chime go off, and they had an alarm system that was not recording anything, not sending anything out to a central location at that point. But if you opened a door to the home, you would hear beep, beep, a little chime go off. They said, you know, it's strange. We're in bed and we hear the chime, but we don't think anything of it. Wait a minute. You live in the middle of Washington, D.C., and your door alarm goes off and, you know, late at night and you don't think anything of it. Come on now. okay. And then We don't hear anybody climbing 16 wooden steps, which were 100 years old and creaked like all get out. I know because I was up and down those steps hundreds of times. We don't hear anything. But then we hear three, I don't know, grunts 
or moans and we think we better go investigate and we come downstairs from our third floor bedroom and he's dead in the bed there's nobody there we haven't seen anybody we haven't heard anybody then dylan comes out of his bedroom on the second floor hey what's up guys come on you know i may have been born at night but i wasn't born last <laughs> night right so i mean so, so when you're hearing this and and th this is there's so much more and I don't I don't mean to cut you off but I know people are wondering this you're the prosecutor you're hearing what they're telling you know th these are their first stories their first statements we know how important that is right this is on report they may change their stories later this could be impeachment for later but when these first stories are causing all these alarm bells to go off in your prosecutor head what do you do? What are the first steps that you do? Because this is what's on the record right now. And they're the only people who are witnesses to the crime. Yeah. And mind you, I'm not monitoring these interrogations. They're not interrogations. They're interviews at this point because they're not uh, in custody. I'm not monitoring them in real time. All of these things are being done by a squad of the MPD homicide branch. And they're obviously coordinating with one another. They're taking breaks. The three guys from time to time would say, I, I want to take a break. They would go out and all sit together in a Mercedes, which came to be the Mercedes meeting. Then they would come in and their stories would slightly change. Oh, wait, they let and, them get together after? Yeah, well, in the midst yeah, of they, the... you know, they were not in custody. So when these oh. guys said, listen, I'm, I want to go outside and take a break. And they all ended up in a Mercedes together. You know, you have to be careful not to exercise the kind of control that might put them in custody such that you have to Mirandize them. So it was the, the most dramatic flip-flop in a story that I became aware of shortly after all of these interviews were over was Joe Price. Joe Price was telling the detectives, I'm the first one in the room. I see Robert lying there, you know, with the gaping chest wounds, and he has a knife lying across his chest, not in his chest, but lying flat on his chest. So he said, so I think I took it and I put it on the nightstand. Well, then he goes out into the Mercedes and there was another individual in the Mercedes. It was four of them. It, it was a, a neighbor who had come to be there for support. And you know what Joe Price told his friend in the Mercedes? I had to pull the knife out of Robert's chest. I couldn't believe it. He walked back in the interrogation room and said, well, you know, I think I told you that the knife was sitting on his chest, but it might have been in his chest. Maybe I pulled it out. I don't I don't remember. You don't remember pulling a knife out of your friend's chest. Come on. That's something you never forget for as long as you live. All of these stories just stunk. And then during the course of the interviews, they asked Dylan Ward if he was willing to take a polygraph. He said he was. We had him transported over the FBI Washington field office. And it was the, the results of the polygraph. It was like a James Brown concert off the charts, right? Deception indicated like crazy, but he didn't give it up, right? He didn't, he didn't give it up. But again, that's an important investigative tool, though not admissible in court. But, you know, it was pretty clear. And the two target questions on the polygraph were, did you kill Robert? Do you know who killed Robert? Failed failed deception deception so you know we kind of knew we were on we believed we were on the right track that these guys some combination of them were responsible both for the murder and they were all, all responsible for the cover-up so what did you make of the timeline in this case you know we've got robert arriving at about 10 30 and the 911 call is 79 minutes later at 11 49 that's not a lot of time and it's cut down even more by an email that he supposedly sent at 11.08 p.m., only 41 minutes before the 911 call. That is not a lot of time to do much of anything. What were your thoughts on the timeline? Did it cause you any pause that these three guys could have pulled this murder off and covered it up in that short period of time? Yeah, it remains confounding to this day because Robert arrived by all accounts at the house and we had him like card swiping out of Radio Free not Radio Free Asia, uh, some other location where he was attending a CLE the night before. Um, we managed to put what we thought was a pretty reliable timeline together, getting Robert at, arriving at Swan Street at the house at about 1030 at night 
and they placed the 911 call at 11.49 p.m. So that's not a lot of time. And then I believe the, the window narrowed even further because the next door neighbor, now these are 100 plus year old row houses and the walls are paper thin. So the neighbors could often hear what was going on next door. And the neighbor next door uh, reported to us that while a local TV newscaster named Maureen Bunyan, something of a, a very well-known newscaster in DC circles, while she was on TV, which had to be between 11 p.m. and 11.30 p.m., we checked with the, the network to make sure there were no delays, courtesy of games. And while her face was on TV, Maureen Bunyan, the woman next door heard a high-pitched scream. I happen to believe the high-pitched scream, the best evidence showed, was Victor coming upon the body and screaming at what he saw. That was reinforced when you hear Victor on the 911 call not long thereafter. So what that basically does is, you know, it, it puts the, the discovery by Victor of, of Robert's body sometime between 11 and 11.30, which means Robert's only been there for 30 to 60 minutes. But then think about this, if the high-pitched scream was Victor discovering the body or discovering what Joe and or Dylan or both of them were in the process of doing to Robert that resulted in his death. They didn't call 911 until 1149, which gave them 19 minutes at the, the shortest time period or up to 49 minutes if the scream came in at the top of the 11 o'clock hour. But, you know, 49 to 19 minutes is not a lot of time to clean up a crime scene, get a story together, and then put it in play by calling 911. But they clearly had gotten a story together because the minute Victor is on the phone, he's using the royal we. Well, we heard a door chime and we heard a scream and we think the intruder has one of our knives. What the F are you talking about? We think the intruder has one of our knives? This is not the stuff of 911 calls, and I've heard hundreds, if not thousands. And so you mentioned, you know, Victor talking about how the intruder has one of their knives, which apparently he didn't because he was sticking out of Robert's body, apparently, or supposedly, when they found them. But I think, to me... There's so many striking things about this case and wild things about this case, but one of the most striking are the wounds themselves. These three wounds into his body, one of which I guess went through his sternum into his, his heart and how, well, number one, well, I'll let you, I'll let you talk about this. What, what struck you about the stab wounds? Yeah. The only thing that was wrong about the forensic findings during the autopsy was everything. So you have three nearly identical stab wounds to Robert's torso and no blood on his chest, which caused the EMS worker, Jeff Baker, to say the minute he stepped into that room, the hair on the back of his neck stood up because he'd been to a lot of crime scenes and he knew this was wrong all day long. So you have three stab wounds. You have no blood on the scene, virtually. Two discrete spots of blood under Robert's body, which seems to be runoff from kind of over his shoulder and, and, and across his chest. You do have a white towel in the room with a little bit of blood that had a pattern to it, which I can talk about in a minute. But on the body, these three stab wounds, it's, it's hard to describe this without having a visual. But assume you're standing at the foot of a bed and you're looking up at the head of the bed and somebody is lying on their back, arms at their sides, head on the pillow. If you were to walk around the right side and stab somebody three times, the sharp edge, blunt edge of the wounds would have the kind of orientation you would expect because I'm holding a knife, I wish the viewers could see it. You know, we know how maniacal killers hold knives when they're plunging it into somebody's chest. They're holding it with the blunt edge away from them and the sharp edge toward them. You don't do it the other way, right? But the curiosity is, even though on that side of the bed, 
was where the door was. And you would expect if the killer had walked in the door and stabbed Robert three times, then the blunt edge, sharp edge orientation of the wounds would be a particular way. They were the exact opposite, as if the killer walked in, walked around the foot of the bed, walked up the other side of the bed. And mind you, when he was walking around the bed, you know what the intruder would have passed? One wallet, two wallets, Blackberry, Movado watch, some computers. You know, wasn't interested in any of that, was just interested in going around the other side of the bed and creating three identical stab wounds, identical in width, depth, orientation, and blunt edge, sharp edge. And here's the thing. The three wounds, two of them went through nothing but soft tissue and organs. The middle wound was driven directly through Robert's sternum. My expert witness testified, one of my two forensic pathologists, testified that the amount of force that it would have taken to drive a knife through somebody's sternum, it would be like driving a dull knife through a truck tire tread, right? It takes a lot of force. And let me tell you, I know how much force it would have taken to drive a knife through Robert's sternum because I was at the autopsy and I held Robert's sternum in my hand. It was retained as an item of evidence. And I felt the density of it, how hard it is. And one of the things I regret, and I really do, I mean, listen, anybody who tries cases looks back and says, damn, why didn't I do this better and this better and this better? I, it felt a little maudlin to me at the time, but I probably should have slapped a government exhibit sticker on the evidence bag that contained Robert Sternum and put it in the hands of the judge and let her feel how much force it would have taken. How do you create three identical wounds, particularly in depth, when two are like driving a hot knife through a loaf of butter and one is like forcing a knife through the tread of a truck tire, identical wounds, okay? That's not normal. And I assume, you know, when that person did that with all that force, they drove the knife all the way in, right? All the way to the hilt. You would have thought there were no real, there were no hilt bruises. And, you know, there, there's, there's so much to, to talk about here, but there was a knife on the scene on the nightstand, kind of gingerly perched on the nightstand, and it had blood on it. Talk more about that in a minute. But the length of the blade was about an inch longer than the depth of the wounds. So that means not only did the killer use dramatically different force to inflict these three identical wounds, but he stopped shy of driving the entire knife blade into Robert's body. The spoiler alert is we do not believe, and I will never believe, the knife that we found on the nightstand was the knife that was used to kill Robert, particularly because Victor Zaborski helpfully told 911, we think the intruder has one of our knives. Mind you, the knife that was perched on the nightstand was from the kitchen butcher block in the home, indigenous to the home, as they say. And so think about it. The, the I don't know, burglar, the maniacal killer, came into the house through an inadvertently left unlocked and open back door, we can talk about that in a minute, without a weapon. He decided what he or she would do is take one of the smallish knives out of the butcher block in the kitchen and then make his way up those 16 wooden stairs without being heard by anybody in the house. When you get to the top of those stairs, you're right in front of Dylan Ward's bedroom door, but apparently the killer wasn't interested in what was behind that door, does a 180, walks all the way to the front of the townhouse, opens the guest room door, goes all the way around the bed, inflicts the wounds that we've just discussed, comes back around, gingerly leaves the knife on the nightstand, makes his way back down the wooden stairs, leaves the house, again, no forced entry in or out, and disappears into the night. So... You know, none of this is making a lot of sense. Let me let me finish up with the knife and the, and the scene, and then we can talk more about the findings on the body. So the knife that was on the nightstand, not only was it the wrong size to has, have inflicted these wounds, possible, but not likely. You can always insert a blade only halfway in, right? Not impossible, but not usual. The knife also had blood on it, but more interestingly, it had looped impressions on it, according to my FBI trace evidence analyst. And it appeared as if a white cotton towel that was found in the room with very small quantities of blood on it 
had been used to apply blood to the blade of the knife, leaving not only looped patterned impressions on the blade, but leaving tons of white cotton fibers on the knife blade. This, I will always believe, was a plant knife that we found on the nightstand, not the actual knife that was used to kill Robert. There's more about the knife that we can talk about in a few minutes that I believe was used to kill Robert. But the other findings on Robert's body is he had multiple needle puncture marks on him, some on his neck, some on his chest, some on the top of one of his feet, I believe one on his arm. And what we did was meet with everybody who put hands on Robert that night from the EMS workers that found him and transported him to the George Washington University Hospital, to the nurses and the doctors and the technicians that worked on him in the ER, and none of them. And we showed them the autopsy report with the placement of all these needle puncture marks. None of them created the majority of those needle puncture marks. They could account for one or two, but certainly nobody was sticking him in the neck with anything, right? And the other findings were that these three stab wounds were described by the medical examiner who performed the autopsy as perfect, almost surgical slit-like defects, no imperfections at all. Robert had no restraint marks. He had no bruising. He had no defensive wounds on his hands. He didn't even have blood on his hands as if he had clutched the, his chest as, as he was being stabbed. And there's a lot more to it. We had some petechial hemorrhages in the, in the whites of the eyes. But the conclusion by the, the forensic pathologists was that Robert was incapable of moving. He was incapacitated at the time he was being stabbed. However, he survived those stab wounds for a period of time. They know that in part because they found digested blood in his intestines that had traveled down his intestines, courtesy of peristalsis, the action that will move things through your, your intestines. And there were other indications, but they concluded that he was incapable of moving, incapacitated in some way, not restrained. Because if you're restrained and somebody inserts a knife in your body, you're going to jerk like all get out. It's involuntary. You can't not jerk. He didn't jerk. He didn't move. There were no imperfections in these stab wounds. So those findings led us down the path of what kind of incapacitating drugs might have been used. And I can veer off there, or I can talk about the most curious forensic findings of all. You, you tell me which all. way. You, all. Of all. <laughs> I mean, uh, why don't you keep going with, with the drug? So that, yes, so you're seeing these puncture wounds, but we want to hear it all. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to us talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates national average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who save with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Okay, so paralytics. We, I had to educate myself. My team had to educate itself on the wonderful world of paralytics. What we learned, and by the way, his tox screening was negative. He had no drugs of abuse. I believe we tested for ketamine. It may have been a second round of testing. And he had, we, we could find no drugs in his body whatsoever. And also we made sure that he hadn't had any medical treatment that would have produced needle puncture marks. He didn't use acupuncture. And so we covered all the bases. Clear, well, those tox tests don't necessarily pick up every drug, but it, you're talking about like the street drugs that you would think of if he had, you know, done cocaine or heroin or smoked something, a date rape drug, those sorts of things. Is that what you're talking about? Correct. 
but well, okay. What we learned, because once we realized, once we had medical experts telling us he was incapacitated, he didn't move, but he lived for a, a period of time after those stab wounds were inflicted. We had to learn all about what kind of drugs could have done that to him. We learned about succinylcholine, which is the most common anesthetic slash paralytic that is used in hospitals, you know, around the country every day. It, it, it can be found on hospital crash carts. It's pretty easily accessible. And, and one of the interesting things about succinylcholine is when you use it in the body, there is no tox screening that can detect it because it is designed to break down in the system very quickly. It's, it's made by and large of things that are naturally occurring in the body. And that's why when they remove an IV line, when you're you know, anesthetized, you come to very quickly. And we learned there was no way to detect the most common paralytic incapacitating drug that could have been used. The only possibility is if you get to it quickly and you excise around the injection site, you might be able to find a little bit in the skin surrounding the injection site. Robert was long since buried and probably decaying, not to be maudlin, and we were not gonna exhume him on the off chance we could find that. Because all of this, mind you, takes a long time to gather all this information, get the, the results of the autopsy, the tox screens and all that. So, you know, the, the succinylcholine thing was interesting, but we figured we were not really going to be able to prove it because we wouldn't be able to detect it with any sort of test. And we went to, I think it was NMS lab. We obviously, the FBI lab, we used all the labs we could think of to try to figure out, is there any way to figure out if he had a drug, any paralytics in his body? But really the most bizarre finding was that Robert went to sleep in a, a t-shirt and a pair of gym shorts. And these three guys were in a three-way polyamorous relationship. They were well known in the gay community in DC. Joe was a law firm partner at Aaron Fox. Victor Zaborski was an ad executive at the International Dairy Association. If you recall the Got Milk ad campaign, that was actually a product of Victor's work. Dylan Ward was a masseuse and, a, and a, he did any number of things and was a bit of an enigma. These three guys were very social. They were out and about. They were well known in DC generally. And what we came to learn was that Joe and Dylan were also into very, very hardcore s and practices. And part of what we had to combat was people, you know, were saying, well, you're just going after these guys because of their unusual lifestyle. And no nothing could be further from the truth. What consenting adults do is their business. And frankly, I'll fight for their right to do it. But when a dead young lawyer ends up in their guest room in the most inexplicable of circumstances, now you're my problem. And I'm going to look into every aspect of your life. What we found hidden away in Dylan's bedroom was just an enormous amount of some really hardcore S&M equipment, stuff designed to inflict pain for pleasure. We also learned that Joe was the leader of this three-way relationship. They called themselves a family. And he was very type A, very loud, aggressive, aggressive, really obnoxious. I think that was the consensus even among his friends. And Dylan was a very quiet, sort of submissive person, but in their private life, the roles were reversed and Dylan was the dominant one and Joe was the submissive one. And we found lots of evidence of some very extreme S&M practices. A rape examination kit was done. A sexual assault exam was performed at, at autopsy. Swabs were taken of both the exterior of Robert's genitals and his rectum and the interior, the sort of anal cavity. And the medical examiner who was very meticulous said, the one thing I don't do is cross-contamination. So when I'm getting an interior sample, it is going to be pristine, okay? So when the test results come back from the swabs, we find that there is semen, sperm, up inside Robert's anal cavity, not from the exterior, but from the interior. At which point we're like, okay, this was a sexual assault. This was something that, you know, maybe started out consensual. Maybe it went bad. Who knows what happened? 
you know, and I think there was this natural inclination of people to believe, well, Robert was probably over there to engage in this, these kind of practices with his longtime friends. Let me, let me lay that to rest. Nothing could be further from the truth. We learned everything about Robert that there was to learn, including from his computer. And if he was living a double life, we would have known about it. I got to know not only his family, but his high school friends, his college friends, his law school friends. And Robert was exactly as wonderful a, a, a young man as he appeared to be. Not that you can't be a wonderful young man and engage in those kind of, of practices. More power to you if, if that's what you're into. That was not what Robert was into. And that's not why Robert was at the house that night. So it looked like it, it was, might've been a sexual assault. So once we had a, a sperm and semen sample from inside Robert, we sent it for DNA testing. And we thought this is gonna be the identity of the perpetrator, right? Or one of the perpetrators. And finally, we're gonna have the big break that we need in the case until we get the DNA results. And it turns out that it was Robert's own sperm inside his anal cavity. And that is a moment when myself and the detective and my team, there's just stunned silence because, you know, not only did it not identify a perpetrator, but how in the hell does that happen, right? Men have natural firewalls that that's not a normal finding. So I hired an s and expert, really kind of an academic, somebody who was steeped in that world and that culture and the study of s and practices, an older gentleman, he was wonderful and helped educate us about a lot of the practices in that community. It also helped explain lots of the equipment that we found because, you know, I thought I was kind of a worldly guy. I was in the army. I was, you know, this, and, and I'm looking at this stuff and I'm like, I have no idea. I don't know how you use it, what it's intended to do. And he's like, well, yeah, yes. And I don't want to get into stories that sound almost comical about the description of what these things are designed to do. But, you know, he did explain that, you know, it's not an unusual practice for somebody to, and these are the kind of things you don't often talk about in polite circles or at dinner parties, but, you know, it, it's not an unusual practice for consenting adults who are running S&M scenes. You know, one, one guy ejaculates, so the other guy uses the ejaculant as lubricant to then penetrate the, the, the guy anally, and that's one way your own sperm can travel up inside of you. And all of which, you know, is understandable, but, you know, we, we had pretty much concluded that whatever happened in that house, Robert was not a willing participant. So we had to kind of figure out, okay, what are the likely theories here? And please stop me because I'll talk for the next six hours. If, if you have questions, please jump now, in. Now, the theories is the most mind boggling of all of these. So if you have theories, we want to hear them. Yeah. So first of all, remember that Joe and Victor were on the third floor in the bedroom together. Now, the problem is you can't really credit what any of them say. Can but... I ask a quick question on that? Sure. I saw somewhere, was it that Victor was coming home from a business trip? Do you, when yeah. did he come home? Did he see Robert? I thought he did not see Robert. So do you, can you talk us through it just a little bit as to what Robert knew where he was? That night. That, that's, that's a great point that I had forgotten. So Victor often traveled for business. Victor was not supposed to be there that night. He came home from a business trip early. My best recollection is that you're right, that Victor remained in the bedroom upstairs when this is the story they told us when Robert arrived and he didn't even come down, which also made no sense because Victor was the one who was generally taking the lead on doing the hors d'oeuvres and making the drinks. And he was like the hostess with the mostess. He was, and he was actually, let me, let me be clear. He was the guy I tried to break and I tried to bring on board unsuccessfully. Uh, I viewed him as an abused spouse. And, and here's why. He came across as really a, a lovely, genuine guy. I met with him a number of times with his lawyer, Tommy Conley, who's a well-known criminal defense attorney in DC, also used to be a homicide prosecutor with us. He's a very good man and a good attorney. He represented Victor and Victor's world revolved around his husband, Joe. Joe's world revolved around his lover and his partner in the s and relationship, Dylan. Dylan's world revolved around nobody knows what. 
He was an enigma. He would make trips to Thailand by himself doing whatever. Nobody knows. You know, you have a sense. But and Victor was not into S&M, certainly not the way Joe needed to scratch that itch he had. So what Joe said to his husband, Victor, is, you know, you know what I'm going to do for you? You know what I'm going to do to make our relationship stronger? I'm going to get a third guy to come into our relationship and satisfy me in the S&M practices the way I need to be satisfied. That's going to take the pressure off you, and it's going to make our relationship stronger. And Victor was such a weak individual that he said, yes, Joe, whatever you want, Joe. The world revolves around you, Joe. Let me tell you, if I told my wife, let me tell you what I'm going to do for you, dear. I got this au pair who's, you know, she's, come on. Victor was an abused spouse, and I will always have a, a good, healthy dose of empathy for, for him because I think he got pulled into the cover-up. And they said, this is what you're going to say. Now go call 911. And at that point, it's mutual destruction. Nobody was can there any flip. Was there any indication of a relationship between Dylan and Victor? to and this is the these are statements that these guys made during the interviews they were trying to move in that direction so that it was a full three-way relationship including on the intimacy front so let's go back to the stories they tell because when nobody's really telling you what went on inside the house you're kind of flying blind but if victor and joe were truly upstairs when this went on well then they can alibi one another Right. If you give him the benefit of the doubt and Dylan can't be alibied by anybody. He's on the same floor as the guy that ended up dead and he's got no alibi. And here's another hair raising aspect of this. Oh, you know, I, I relive this thing. I swear so much. Not that I mind, but let's make sure we get the tip line out at the end of this, because because we're not done with these guys. I may not be a prosecutor anymore, but I'll go back as a special AUSA in a minute if they will let me, if we can make pro, and I've told them, DOJ knows this. I don't think DOJ, I think there may be a stay away at this point, but when the EMS worker arrives, he gets to the top of the stairs and he sees Dylan coming out of the bathroom on the second floor with a bathrobe on. He looks him right in the eye. He says, what's going on? What's going on? Dylan looks at him. Dead friend is in the bedroom 30 feet away. He doesn't say a word. He turns, walks into his bedroom, and closes the door. Okay. I like Dylan already for being involved. Every, I mean, you've heard the 911 call. Oh, my God, my friend's up there. He's dead. Go help him. Go. Help. No. So you got to like Dylan. Another reason I like Dylan is because as we're searching his room, and I was present during the search in the days that followed the murder, we find a cutlery set cubby hold away in a in a little built in above his bed. It's like a gift set. It's a, in a box. It's a three piece cutlery set. It is a large carving knife, a large carving fork that you hold the turkey with, and then a smaller knife. The large knife is there. The large fork is there. The smaller knife, the little cutout where it would lay in. So first of all, I don't know about y'all. I keep all my good cutlery in my bedroom, right? <laughs> And the knife that was missing, we got a replica. Guess what? And the width of it is more consistent with the wounds to Robert's chest than the plant knife that we found on the nightstand. Again, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to start putting some of this together. So, but I couldn't break anybody. Believe, I tried mightily. I tried everything I knew how to drive wedges and put pressure on to burst pipes and I couldn't, you know, I was just not very good at coming up with a cooperator in this one. So everybody thought the case was dead. We investigated it for years. And I decided they've covered up this crime. And they've done it successfully. And I'm not going to let them get away with it. I'm going to indict all three for conspiracy to obstruct justice, obstruction of justice, and tampering with evidence. And I'm going to take them to trial. And as was often the case, not everybody at the Department of Justice, the higher ups were excited about me bringing this case against three well-to-do white males. And, you know, I don't know that I ever said, you know, y'all can fire me or you can let me bring this case. But I made it clear I was going to, you know, look, I was, a, I was an army guy for six and a half years. So I know how to 
obey a lawful order. And, and at the end of the day, it wasn't really my decision to make. But I said, I, we need to try these guys, win, lose, or draw. One of the things about federal prosecutors is I think we sometimes shy away from the tough cases. We, we only like the sure wins. And I think we have an, ob an obscenely high conviction rate of 99.3% you know, uh, conviction rate on at least one count. That, that, that's obscene. That does a disservice to the American people. You, know, you need to take chances in righteous cases, even if there's a chance you're going to lose. So I finally got the approval to bring this conspiracy case and I indicted all three on those three charges, obstruction, conspiracy to obstruct, and tampering with evidence. Guys, I want to talk about one of our new favorite sponsors, Penrose First Leaf. If you're a wine lover like me, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. We have found the most awesome personalized wine club. It has amazing wines and exclusive perks. I'm talking about First Leaf. Now, you guys know me. Big fan of bourbon. Wine, I don't really know anything about it. I've always liked wine, but didn't really know what I was looking for. Didn't really know what I was going to like. Well, that's where First Leaf comes in. They get to know you. You can answer a few quick questions on their website about what flavors you like, what styles you like, and how adventurous do you want to be. I went full adventurous, and I ended up getting wines from around the world. I loved First Leaf so much that I signed up. I am a member and I'm getting wine shipments with a personalized collection of wines that I love. And my wife and I enjoy so much opening them up and trying new styles from new places that we never would be able to enjoy were it not for First Leaf. And it's so easy. First, you just answer a few quick questions on their website about what flavors you like, how often you drink, whether you prefer red, white, rosé. And based on these answers, First Leaf curates an amazing selection of wines just for you. And then once I drink those wines, I rate them and they get to know my wine selection even better. And best of all, I get to choose when I want my box delivered and how often I get new assortments of wine. Being part of the First Leaf Wine Club also has its perks. As a member, we get access to their incredibly helpful wine concierge. So if I want wine pairing advice or to talk about the wines in my box, I can always speak to one of their experts. Plus, we get member exclusive pricing on every order. Join the club today and discover new wines you'll love with First Leaf. Go to tryfirstleaf.com slash prosecute to get your first box. That's T-R-Y-F-I-R-S-T-L-E-A-F dot com slash prosecute. Tryfirstleaf.com slash prosecute. And it's interesting because, you know, we've described it as a murder case so often, but yeah, I don't. I don't know of any other circumstance where you don't know who the killer is, and you're bringing an obstruction case. I mean, that had to be one of the most unique prosecutions in history. And what, what were the sort of the unique? I may be the only person who's interested in this, but what were the unique challenges of prosecuting a case like that, where you know someone's murdered, but you can't say who did it? Yeah, I mean, the the challenges were were many, and the strengths were few. What I tried to do is because it was a judge trial, not a, not a jury trial. We can talk about that in a minute. To tell the judge that, look, the fact that we don't know who did this, we don't have a clue as to who plunged that knife into Robert's chest, that's a strength, not a weakness. That's a tribute to the success of the cover-up because there are only three guys who can tell us what happened. So, I mean, it was an expert-heavy case. We had lots of, lots of expert witnesses. I got to cross-examine Henry Lee. Yeah, I got to cross-examine him. I did not think he was a particularly good witness for the defense. And it was a challenge because, yeah, you got a dead body. You got three guys there. We had facts that we could really attribute to each one of these guys that made them good for the cover-up, beyond a reasonable doubt, in my opinion. And one of the difficult tactical decisions we had to make was – did we want to let them have a judge as the trier of fact rather than force them to a jury? They moved to waive their right to a jury trial, but we had the opportunity to object to that. <laughs> the judge, Lynn Leibovitz, was actually my former chief of homicide at the U.S. Attorney's Office years earlier, and she was the first one to make me a supervisor in the homicide section. I was her deputy chief, and I thought 
She will understand the evidence here. She will understand as unusual as it is. And so we had lots of powwows. And the one thing I was concerned about, obviously I wanted to win a conviction because I wanted these guys to be held accountable for what they did, but I wanted them to get a fair trial. And I, I do, I, I always had a lingering concern that if you put their lifestyle and their sort of dungeons worth of crazy equipment, my, my take on it, that we found hidden in Dylan's bedroom and some of the extreme practices that Joe and Dylan were involved in, you lay all that in front of a jury, there's going to be a risk of unfair prejudice. Though I thought with the forensic findings on Robert and in Robert, all of that I thought was relevant to what these guys did to Robert before they killed him. So all things considered, we decided not to oppose their request to waive their right to a jury trial and have the case tried by the judge. In hindsight, maybe that was the wrong decision. At what point in the how, – how much before trial was that decision made? Was it before – I know there are some rulings that she ruled upon to keep out of the trial. So was the decision to go forward with a judge trial, a bench trial before kind of the – you know, motions in limine. Do you happen to remember? And, and I'm asking this because I wondered if some of her rulings were because she didn't want prejudice before a jury. But obviously, we know that oftentimes judges will say, I'm not going to keep this out because I, as the fact finder, can parse through, you know, prejudice yeah. versus fact. Yeah, I think it made the co conspirator statements issue a lot easier once she came in because she could be presumed to only apply those statements against the defendant, you know, against whom it was admissible. I don't remember the sequence. Of, there were so many motions over time. I don't remember the sequence of litigating all those motions and when they asked to, to waive their right to a jury trial. I don't have a precise memory of that. I think it was fairly close in time to the trial, but I'd have to go back and look at old transcripts. So we, we tried the case for six weeks. I tried it with two wonderful, wonderful trial partners, Pat Martin, who was the lead prosecutor on all of the Blackwater prosecutions in D.C. and a very dear friend, one of my homicide guys, and Rachel Lieber, who was also one of my RICO partners uh, over the years and who was just, th these people are remarkable prosecutors. And, you know, I, I wish I had the skills that these two people had. And we tried the crap out of that case. They had three very high-powered defense teams and they hired the best experts and you know, it was a six week trial. It was interesting because there was wall to wall coverage locally. And, you know, the cameras were chasing my witnesses into the courthouse, out of the courthouse. And there were a, there was a, a group of three bloggers, three men who covered it wall to wall. Blogging was just kind of becoming a thing. And they did remarkable work there. They two of them, one passed away appear in the documentary briefly. And, and I really am very fond of them. And I would read the blog every night. And frankly, I would occasionally get interesting tactical ideas about what I might want to include in my closing argument because, or my rebuttal argument, because, you know, there were some takes out there that, geez, I hadn't even thought of, you know, and I'll take, I'll take good information and arguments from anywhere. So we tried it for six weeks. Leave to my core, we proved it beyond a reasonable doubt. Judge Leibovitz said <laughs> that I do not believe this was an intruder. So what she concluded was these three guys were lying about and covering up the true circumstances of the crime. And they were. There was ample evidence of it. But then she added, paraphrasing, you know, I, I, maybe I could be persuaded to a moral certainty that they were involved but I can't get there to an evidentiary certainty. And the question I've always asked is how do you get to a moral certainty if it's not based on the evidence? And how do you reject the intruder theory, but not rule, not find that they covered it up criminally, obstructed justice, conspired to do so? So I will forever disagree with Judge Leibovitz's conclusion, but I always have to respect the fact that it's the ruling she made. And the good news, to the extent there's any good news, is I never brought a murder charge. So there are no dub double jeopardy prohibitions from bringing a murder charge if we can ever move forward in the case. And of course, there's a tip line embedded in the two-part Peacock documentary. I've done about six crime shows, true crime shows now. I swore I'd never do another one. But I, I did this one when I was approached because this case will always stay with me. And I do believe when you have three guys who are in the criminal mix, 
it's likely that somebody has run their mouths in the last, in the intervening 12 or 14 years. So boy, I sure would like for somebody to drop a dime and call the detective. One of the detectives who worked the case is still at the Metropolitan Police Department, you know, and, and I hope we can jumpstart the investigation. And the amazing thing about the judges, the judge's opinion, which is available, we put it on our website and encourage everybody to read it. It is very good. I mean, it's it's an excellent opinion. It, it lays out the law very well. It explains reasonable doubt very well. It explains the facts very well. And when you read it, as you're reading it, you are coming to more and more the conclusion, these guys are guilty. These guys are obviously oh, yeah. guilty. And it is just, and then it kind of takes that sort of sharp turn where she's walking you right up to they're clearly guilty and then says, oh, well, I don't know. And, and the thing that always struck me about it was she talks about it as if there might have been one of them who wasn't involved. And I always think of that as she's talking about Victor. I, I just, she doesn't say that, you know, but it's almost like she's saying, well, you know, we know Joe and Dylan are clearly involved, even though she didn't say that. But maybe one of them wasn't. And the thing, I, I don't know, I just didn't, I didn't understand why just because you're not sure whether Victor is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt means that you can't conclude that Dylan is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt and that Joe is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't know if you read it the same way I did or not. Yeah, I and I think Victor was clearly involved in the cover-up from jump. You could hear it in the 911 call, and that was just one of the pieces of evidence against Victor. But I, I do I believe Victor had any role in what happened to Robert that night? No, but a different issue as to whether he was involved in the cover-up, right? And, and I, I have never settled in my mind a leading theory about what happened. But, you know, I learned a lot from the s and expert and other experts that I've talked to over the years. And, you know, this could have been Joe and Dylan involved in kind of the most extreme s and practice imaginable, which is, you know, I am the dominant one and I am ordering you to do something to your friend that you ordinarily would never do, but that's how I'm gonna dominate you. And I've now dominated you for the rest of your life because I know what you did. Or it could be the dominant one saying, you're gonna watch me do something and that's the way I'm gonna dominate you and you can never tell anybody about it. Or maybe they were both involved in actively doing something to Robert. I mean, there are so many theories, all of which sound like wilder than fiction until you look at the evidence and try to make sense of it all. And frankly, I don't know that we will ever make sense of it all unless and until one of these guys has some reason to give it up. And, you know, that's uh, something I struggle with so much. I understand the dominance with Robert generally, but do you think that the plan was to kill Robert all along? Or was that a byproduct, an accident, it went too far? Or was that the entire purpose of whatever began that night? Part of the challenge for prosecutors, as, as you all know, is I think we project what makes sense to us. We apply sort of rationality to, to what might have happened. I tell my jurors all the time, don't expect murder to make sense, okay? If we were required to make sense of murder before you could find beyond a reasonable doubt somebody was guilty, nobody would ever be convicted. Murder doesn't make sense. But to me, it doesn't seem like a guy who they had his 30th birthday party there, they were very long-term friends, they were friends with Robert's wife, Kathy, who's a wonderful, wonderful woman, why, why would they want to intentionally kill Robert? That doesn't make sense unless I just can't understand how the dom-sub relationship works. And the, the, there is this sort of pattern of escalation in those relationships that sometimes calls for more and more and more extreme dominance and submission. So maybe that led to an intentional killing. If I, you know, one of the theories that I've had is maybe they drugged him and they were going to take advantage of him like that. Maybe they so suppressed his respiration and his heart rate and they thought they had killed him. And now they had to cover it up by, by stabbing him three times and saying an intruder did it. And they didn't realize that they hadn't killed him with the drugs, but they killed him with the knife. I mean, so many different possibilities. 
Well, Glenn, I just want to thank you for taking all this time to talk through this case with us. And this has been amazing. I know people are going to be absolutely fascinated by this. This is a case that is equally tragic and mysterious. I don't want to keep you much longer, but Alice, do you have anything else you wanted to ask before we sign off? You know, we're going to give that tip line. As we've said over and over, the people who know what happened so far haven't broken. But we've always said when there's a conspiracy, if there's more than one person, someone's going to talk eventually. But that doesn't mean someone may not know something that might help along. So, I mean, have have tips continued to come in? Can you give people ideas of maybe something that would be helpful that they may not know is important that they should be calling in? The types of information that could help spur along this investigation? Yeah, I, I think the, the ask that I would have is if anybody knows or has interacted with Victor Zaborski, Joe Price, or Dylan Ward, now let me give you the, the names of two of the men which have changed. Joe Price is now Joe Anderson, Anderson being the most common name in the United States. Dylan Ward is now Dylan Thomas. And Victor Zaborski remains Victor Zaborski. I believe the trio is no longer together. If anybody knows them, if you've talked to them, if you, you know, ever worked with them, or if you ever encountered anybody who talked about them, I think that is what would be most fruitful for us to know and for us to have a conversation about. You know, I think we pretty much exhausted <laughs> who might have been at 1509 or the 1500 block of Swan Street, Northwest Washington, D.C., at about 11 o'clock at night on what was the date of the crime, August 2nd, 2006. I mean, I think less likely. But Joe in particular loves to run his mouth. And I think it probably eats away at Victor. So maybe he has confided in somebody. I'm, I'm, I'm less inclined to think Dylan has has run his mouth about it. But, you know, I, I will add that a wrongful death suit was brought against the three guys by Kathy Wan, and they couldn't settle that case quickly enough. And they paid out, I'm guessing, buku dollars, but it was not publicly disclosed. But, you know, they were pretty quick to take responsibility for the wrongful death of Robert in a civil suit. So I think we were on the right track all along. And I wish the judge had made what I believe is the right decision to hold them accountable for the cover-up of the murder. But it's not too late. And if you're out there and you're listening to this and you have any information that you want to share, you can contact the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police Department by calling the tip line at 202-727-9099. You can remain anonymous. You know, if you're one of those people who we often have who would rather reach out to us, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to pass along your tips. This is a case that can be solved and should be solved. And I remain convinced that three people cannot keep a secret for their whole lives. So I hope that there will be justice at some point in this case. Well, Glenn, thank you so much for joining us. You, you can come back any case you ever want to talk about. (laughs) Just let us know. We'd love to have you back. And, and maybe one day you'll get that salsa and get to prosecute this case. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. And I, I appreciate you guys getting the word out about the case. And it, it was nice talking with you about it. Great. Great to awesome. have you, Glenn. Thank you. And check out so Justice Matters with Glenn every single day. This man does not sleep, as you can tell, full of energy and even better legal analysis. Thanks, Glenn, for joining us. Thanks, Absolutely. Alex. Justice Matters. If you guys enjoy this, which I know you have, check it out. All right, everybody. Well, we'll be back soon. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Here, I'll be right back. Okay, I'm going to get in the mode. You get in the mode. Because this is kind of intense. Okay, I'll tell I'll tell my wonderful story. Yeah, tell the your reason stories. the reason that I'm a little like thrown off right now, um, and I think we set this, we canceled it, we set it back up. But my wonderful family, who I love very much, family of six, four young children, gave me three hours notice and showed up at my house, <laughs> which is very fun. But-
Thank you very much. Just telling everyone how I'm nervous because I might get sued after today's episode, and I'm not sure if I'm ready for that yet. <laughs> uh. Okay. What were nice. you getting? What is I that? I need a knife. <laughs> what? <laughs> What's screaming all month long during Pluto TV's April Ghouls? Watch hauntingly good movies like Evil Dead, 30 Days of Night, and Bram Stoker's Dracula. <laughs> or Holy Water hits like The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands of movies and TV shows available on live and on demand. Download the Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start screaming, I mean streaming, now.